everybody, welcome to the Nature Journal Club. Um, you are in, a, in for a special treat this month. We have a guest instructor, um, Kristen Muser, is a longtime um, nature journaler, graphic designer, um, really took to nature journaling like a big dog and is now a major nature journaling influencer. Um, she teaches classes in California and she's recently moved to Nevada, so Nevadans who are watching this, there will soon be a Nature Journal Club starting around the Las Vegas area, so um, be sure to check that out. Um, she is a, a gifted teacher and really has useful stuff to share with you today. Um, I was just in the morning workshop up in uh, Marin County and I came away with this whole checklist of like, oh, I never thought about that. And I've got all these exciting new ideas that I want to go apply in my nature journal. So I'm really, really excited about it. I'm sure that you are going to, uh, to, to, to love it. Um, if you want to learn more about Kristen, on this table right up here, we have a, actually I'll, I'll bring some around and pass them out to folks. Uh, we've got um, her recent classes. You can also find out about her on her website, Nature Muse. A nature Muse and their uh, business card is there with all of my contact information. So for folks at home, Nature Muse. M-E-U-S-E. Uh, M-E-U-S-E. <laughs> and um, it's, uh, if you have ever sort of felt like, like I, I don't want to put my brush down on paper, I'm feeling kind of blocked here, you need to be in one of Kristen's workshops. You'll walk out the other side of the workshop going like, oh wow, check that out, grab my journal, kind of go. Um, really freeing, very, very targeted, high percentage ideas. It's, um, and you're gonna love this class. Please give a warm Nature Journal Club welcome to Kristen Muser. Thank you, thank you Jack, and thank you all for coming today. Um, so, um, this is a class on uh, how to build a Nature Journal page. Um, this, uh, basically, I'd like to go through, this is my process for when I go out into the field. Um, I do, uh, I really encourage people to unplug, so if you're using your cell phone to take photos, put it on uh, airplane mode, so you're not getting any signal, any texts, any phone calls, um, and this helps you become present. Um, gets you started to just, okay, I'm here and nothing else is going on. Um, uh, I often start my day and my teaching days with a poem. And my favorite nature um, poet is Mary Oliver, who um, sadly left us a few months ago. Uh, but her, her thoughts uh, live on, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I find her work so inspirational. It just hits, hits right on the target. Um, this is a poem called Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair and I'll tell you about mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscape. Over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. Calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So that always so kind of does it for me <laughs> um, and, and gets me where I am and, and also um, helps me tap into a, an emotional kind of um, connection with nature um, because her, her, her work is so, her words are so connecting. Um, so once I've read a poem, ideally, um, I'd like to just wander about and see what calls to me. And then I like to follow that call. Um, I um, then 
start writing notes about what I'm seeing, where I am, the time of day, um, location, uh, the temperature. You can even look at your internal temperature and see how you're feeling with, with, with this day. And then I really like to get as close up as I can um, to my subject and to, well, also to do a, a, a landscape that kind of gives a sense of place and also to get up as close as possible to my subject so that I can see the detail, so I can see the color. Um, it's really important to, uh, when you're painting especially, is to get is take your close focus binoculars if you have them and really get up close and then you can see all the nuanced colors that very rarely, if ever, is a subject or an object one color. It's a variation of color depending on how the light hits it um, and just what's going on with that particular leaf, for instance. Um, and then let yourself fall in love with just being there and being you and being with this magical world we live in. Um, so in this, um, in this particular page, um, which is, I, I work in a small page like this. Um, it's called a handbook um, and it's bound so it doesn't wiggle around Ooh, <laughs> like this. <laughs> uh, it doesn't wiggle around so it doesn't smear uh, very much. Um, and it, it encourages me to work small, which is really easier. Um, it's very much easier to work small um, in terms of sketching and definitely in terms of painting. A lot of people are really frightened by watercolor and I, I really encourage you to use it if you, ha you haven't before because it really, uh, you can get the colors down right on, where, which is a little harder with colored pencil. Um, and um, because I do a lot of sketching with my graphite pencil um, and I do a lot of um, shading with it, it makes the whole painting exercise really uh, simpler. Um, so, so my background <coughs> is um, I did I went to UC Berkeley. I did go to uh, did got a degree in art and political science, um, and um, moved to New York. Came back because I wanted to see what graffiti artists were doing, and I was very interested in what political artists were doing. Um, I came back um, and got involved in graphic design. I decided that I needed to make a living <laughs> and that that was one way I could do it while doing art. Um, but on vacation, I have had a family, uh, two children, and on vacation I would go off to, um, by myself, uh, you know, catch an hour here and there and do these little, little um, paintings. They're like little business card size paintings. Um, and they were very meaningful to me. It was kind of like getting close to myself, getting close to nature, um, and it really gave me, helped give me the whole concept of what it is to be present uh, in, in the face of nature. And a big change in my life was when I met Jack about 10 years ago at the Sierra Nevada Field Campus. And um, what that meeting, I, w I went up to, uh, I think it was one of his first um, drawing bird classes up there. And it was just a really powerful experience for me because for the first time I felt, number one, like I was actually, he was teaching, you know, and I really learned something from him. Whereas uh, other classes I took kind of felt flat because there wasn't a lot of instruction and you kind of do it yourself. So I really appreciated that and I've kind of, I have, uh, embrace that in my teaching to try and really give people hands-on experience with color and sketching and, uh, and how to deal with the landscape. Um, so what specifically what it did for me was um, it gave a context for my art. So it wasn't no longer just on, on little tiny cards. It, it, li they, it started to live on a page and um, the next thing that was really important was suddenly my, my paintings could talk. And so uh, 
they had a voice and so I began writing on my pages, writing about what I was observing, also <coughs> writing about what I was feeling. Um, so this, this water makes music as it, as it flows over rocks and sandy spots. Um, if I could read the sound, would it tell me the shapes? And um, this is a, the name of the, um, the falls. It has several different uh, names, so I made sure that I, I wrote those down. Halsey, Holly, um, now they call it Tumbly. <laughs> it's like they're, they're, they're new names all the time. Um, and this one, uh, shape the white water, then the darkness around, then fit it into the rocks, add color, pump up the contrast, that's a really important thing, uh, and uh, brighten the warm areas. Um, so, um, one thing that I learned, so this is something that I learned years ago with Jack about learning how to paint water, which is don't paint the water paint what's around the water, and that then leads you into rocks. So learning how to paint rocks and sketch rocks. Um, so that was a very powerful lesson and really helped me a lot. So this is a, an example of what a journal page could look like, a page without any art or sketches in it. You can read it, but it, it doesn't really give you a context. And this is a, an example of art with no words. And Either, both of them, I think, really benefit from each other, the words and the visuals. So the basic elements that I always like to work with on my pages are words, uh, a miniature landscape, sometimes called a la uh, landscape pito, <laughs> um, close-up sketches, and color matching dots. So I do a lot with um, color matching uh, and mixing colors, and I always test my colors on the page before I paint. And I'll go over with you um, my method of drawing, which is much like Jack's, which is using the blue pencil and a graphite pencil and then painting. Um, so at this point, I'd like to talk about the importance of words and what it can do for your page. Um, the, your words give your paintings a voice and they help you create a sense of place. So in this, um, in, on, in this painting, it's Love's Fall, which is uh, up near the Sierra Nevada Field Campus, uh, Tuesday, June 19th, 2018. In the presence of such power, each god such goddess power, she yearns and flows where she will, gently following the guidance of the earth. You know, that's what I was feeling. And um, I like to try to tap into some sort of prose uh, as well as uh, notes about a particular subject. Um, so words can also provide a way for you to follow along uh, a trail, basically, that leads you from sketch to sketch. Um, so we're drawn to words, we're drawn to reading, we want to know what they say. So as you, as you read along, um, you're also looking at the sketches and following along the page. So you can think about a trail of words, how, how you might use that in your, in, on your page. And then there's scientific content, which is really important and really, you know, some people don't want to do prose, they want to write notes, and that's totally fine. Um, they both have their place. Um, th and they also help shift the interest from uh, just concentrating so much on the art, which is, can be a real hang up for people and it keeps it more in the realm of science and observation. Um, this was a, um, a um, excursion I did with Michael Ellis. And this, uh, this image here uh, was, a, was taken while I was actually um, uh, walking. And I like, I like a little journal because it allows me to um, actually um, paint and uh, walk at the same time. 
So So you're you're busy, you were heading down the trail with another group as you're beating up. Yeah, so I was actually walking because most hikers don't want to stand around and wait for you to paint if you notice. <laughs> so, um, so, and there was no one else who was painting in my class in this excursion. So I was walking down the trail into this canyon uh, uh, near the Amargosa River in um, California, right next to, right near Las Vegas where I'm living now. Um, so that that's an example of what you can do. You don't have to sit down and have all your stuff around you, you can, as the urban sketchers know, you can just like take yourself somewhere and do the best you can while you're standing. Um, so in this one, uh, it was a lot of labeling. That was the trail to the uh, Amargosa River. Uh, this was a desert marigold. Um, this was uh, China Camp, March 25th through 31st. So China Camp is a date farm, actually. Uh, in the uh, near Tacopa, California, which is right over the Nevada border, um, beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, and this was a oops. This was a uh, uh, chuckwalla, little guy, little tiny baby chuckwalla, and it scurried away and into the crevice of a rock and made itself really fat. So you, you know, that's how they keep themselves safe. Um, so, then there's the emo emotional depth, prose and poetry add emotional depth that further intensifies the, the um, memory of a particular day. Um, this was my mother's birthday, June 8th. Um, happy birthday, Mom. Um, misty morning at Ennadale, the, the night dotted by the sound of rain on the roof of my little cabin, the soothing sound of the Eel River down below. Just, um, you know, basically notes about what was going on, very simple, but adds a lot of m memory. Um, so I'll always remember where I was that day and what day it was. Um, and words, uh, as I was saying, they create memories. They help you build a more vivid um, uh, memory of your day in nature. So what some people call these souvenirs, so that you <coughs> basically, as a souvenir you take away from you, um, when you go um, away from the, the setting where you've been painting. And um, the more attention you put to it, the more it's gonna revive um, those memories. And then the miniature landscape creates a location for your individual sketches. So um, rather than just have a page of only close-ups, it gives you a sense of where you were and this is up in the Tuolumne River, or Tuolumne Valley. Um, uh, excuse me, Tuolumne Meadows. And um, this was a sketch of the river where I was hanging out. And this is a sketch of the mountain where my daughter had gone hiking. So you know, she's up there somewhere. Uh, and then I just went bushwhacking and um, uh, found uh, some uh, fire, um, Fireweed along the river, just in blue, just one in bloom, um, and uh, sinking into the beauty. So it's important to get up as close as you can, as I mentioned to your subject. So this is a this is a, a page uh, in Las Vegas at Red Rock Canyon. I live about a half an hour away from there, so I feel really blessed to be able to get into the wild, the wilderness so quickly. Um, it's a protected area, uh, uh, it's a, a conservation area of, of the Bureau of Land Management, and knocked down gorgeous. Lots of water there, there's spring, I think there's something like 32 springs in the Spring Mountains range. Um, so this is a, um, this is a page where it was very hot, it felt very hot anyway, in the sun it feels hotter than it is, and this, in the shade it feels much better. <laughs> Um, and this is a, a juniper here, uh, and I was sitting in the shade of the juniper and uh, to get out of the sun, but also because I wanted to just paint it. And these are the berries and the branches, and then a close-up of the branching. I thought that was a very interesting branching um, uh, system. So sitting in the, in the shade of 
this four foot juniper bush thinking should I get home because I have things to do but this is my work loving the world that's something that Mary Oliver says and I really appreciate it that my work is loving the world um, please if you stop me if you have any questions um, so then the other, another element is the color matching dots. And uh, in my classes I do a lot of work with um, color matching and, and mixing. And this is my palette. It has eight colors in it. And I focus on the um, primary colors, which are magenta, yellow, and cyan. Those, if you, those of you who have um, inkjet printers know that those are the, um, the names of your cartridges. Those are actually the true primary colors, and printers have known that for a hundred years, um, but we are only just learning that. So, thanks to Jack and other people. Um, and then up above, I have my cheek colors, and these are premixed colors. They, they um, just just one second. They have uh, the three primaries in them, but they're like us. They've been fine tuned into specific colors that we recognize. For what? Oh, it's called, well, um, it's um, uh, phthalo blue green shade. GS, you'll see it, GS. And then the yellow is Hansa yellow, and the magenta is called quinacridone pink. So there you're going to see quinacridone rose, quinacridone magenta. Pink is the only one that's going to get you those really sweet, perfect, rose petal pale colors so you want to use the, the pink and Daniel Smith is the only manufacturer of the pink um, so those dots are uh, so the way I work with that is people um, uh, mix the colors and then test them and then fill in their sketch so my <coughs> sketches are done with a blue pencil and then a graphite pencil so I have my four tools um, I have four tools. Well, I have a, a brush and a blue pencil, which I do my uh, initial sketch with, and then I refine it with the graphite. So it kind of goes over, but I'm always continuing to look at um, the, uh, the subject. I'm not just tracing over my blue, blue lines, helping me understand the detail of the placement on the page, and it just allows me to get into what I'm really looking at. I'm not someone who can just knock out a sketch first, uh, you know, on the first go. And um, it also, so it keeps you, me from um, erasing. And the kind of paper that I use, which is basically a bond, um, really can't take too much erasing without scuffing up the surface. Um, I also use a, a um, white gel pen, which, um, in the watercolor world would be a no-no, but uh, in our world, it's fine. Um, I use that, uh, you can see that it, right here, this is all a gel pen uh, uh, area because I got too dark. So, and I wanted to get the snow in. So, here it is there, and this snow is just white paper. So, uh, I, don't, I don't try to overuse it, um, but it's, it's helpful at times, and you can paint over it with a, a, a quick, thin wash of a, of a color if you don't want the stark white. Um, so this is what I have my students do. It, this palette, this is on a page, um, and uh, it's a basically my palette. So I mix the cyan and magenta down here for violence, violets and the um, yellow and cyan for, for greens, and the magenta and yellow for oranges. And I have three yellows, they're all the same color. The middle yellow is to be kept really pristine. Oops. Um, and the yellow closest to the magenta is for making oranges, and the yellow closest to the cyan is for making green. That way, your, if you have just one yellow and you're mixing them with other colors, eventually they're going to get um, pretty muddy. So this helps to eliminate that, that issue. At least you're just using, 
the yellow and magenta and yellow and you know uh, you're not crossing over. Up here are my um, I call them cheek colors. They're just pre-mixed. So this is ultramarine blue. You can get ultramarine blue by mixing cyan and magenta if you're really careful. But this is a quick a shortcut. Um, and this is pureline green. I use this for evergreens. It's kind of a grayish dark green. So often I'll mix it with gold to um, get, get, make it richer. And then this is um, oh, uh, burnt umber. It's a starting part for browns. And this is the magic shadow violet, which is a kind of a reddish gray, which is often what a lot of tree trunks are. And um, Jack was saying, uh, well, Egret? Uh, drawing a pelican. A pelican. Way. So it was like, yeah, it was like, okay, it's right, it's, it's right there for a lot of things and easily modifiable. Um, I use the umber and the um, ultramarine blue together to make a very dark, dark gray. So I don't use black um, because it, uh, I don't, you don't see much black in nature. If you do see it, it's probably going to have a reflection which is going to make it lighter. So it would, it can kind of be too jarring. Um, so I, I stick with the, the mixed color. Um, so again, my basic elements are um, the words, a miniature landscape, close up sketches, and color dots. And you can put your dots anywhere. You know, you can put them next to your sketch, you can make them into a wavy line, you can sometimes people put them around their. Um, borders um, and I want to reference uh, uh, Andy Thrams who is she's teaching a class up at the Sierra Nevada field campus this summer uh, early June um, and she introduced me to the idea that you can just go out into nature if you don't want to start painting just start matching colors and so you know just start putting down those pretty colors they also um, they also get a feeling for the um, the palette of the day so um, it, you know, the, this palette with cloudy skies is going to be different than the same scene with a sunny sky. Um, and mixing colors this way, it's really great to mix colors because it teaches you um, how to, you learn to see color in a way that you may not have seen it before because you have to try to match it. And um, so this can be very exciting. Um, I like to use multiple elements on the page. Um, it, it helps tale, tale, tell a very rich story, and it also takes the pressure off of each individual element. You know, perhaps the bird that isn't quite what you had hoped it would be, or, or you know, it, it lets you experiment also. So this fern, I had never, it says, I've never drawn a fern. Um, uh, so it's um, so complete and so repetitious like the sound of the water today. So it's, it's important to take risks in your nature journal, um, but it's easier to take risks when it's not the only thing on the page. So I really encourage people to fill your page with, with the whole experience, a butterfly, a dipper, a fern, a couple of um, uh, landscape-ish type things. Um, also, when I talk about color matching and color matching dots, you can actually create a landscape uh, just with color matching. So <coughs> this is a, a tall vertical and, and uh, you can um, break it into regions and then label them. This is a sky and um, trees, hill, the red rocks, the um, gray rocks and then the water. So, um, and then again, I've gone ahead and actually done a little landscape, um, but you can just do this. If you don't want to sketch a whole landscape, you can do it with color, color marks, color uh, areas, and then if you go ahead and label them, then you'll remember what it is that you were looking at. So, um, so you keep testing your colors till you find the right one, and then you fill in each each square. Um, 
so titling your so sitting quietly tapping into all your senses is really important so it's not it's sight it's sound it's the scent it could be taste and into your emotional in the, your emotional state um, because we're really affected by the nature around us the, the what's going on in the day what's going on in your day and nature can really um, if you can let yourself kind of blend with nature it can be really lovely um, uh, title your page choose your landscape and then dig into your page so my process is to um, uh, I start with uh, in the best of worlds <laughs> I start with a um, title. This is Point Reyes Lifeboat Station um, on July 19th, 2015. It was a sunny day. Here's a little, uh, little sun. Uh, and then there, it, it just says, with views of the Farallines, Farallines Drake's Bay, San Francisco, uh, and the forever sky. Then I add a sketch um, and color dots. So I would have drawn with my blue pencil the sketch of this of chimney rock, um, and then um, de did detail with my graphite pencil. A lot of shading with my graphite that really simplifies the painting process because your darks and lights are already in there. And then those are the color matching dots, not just for this painting, but for other um, elements that you'll see. Uh, then I label the, um, the rock, and they're brown pelicans on the top and cormorants around the, the edges, right and left. And then I added another, the next day, added another landscape, uh, looking down into the ocean. And then more detail. So there were elephant seals cavorting in the ocean. Um, and um, uh, there were some, some bugs walking around. And I took time to, to put them in because they're really, they really add a lot of energy to a page. They make them come to life uh, when you put an animal or something living in it. Um, and so more, more uh, close up, actually that's not a fin, that's an elephant seal, <laughs> um, bugs and notes. And then more elephant seals down, down here in this area, elephant seals laying <coughs> around on the beach. So placing the elements, um, grids help organize information. Um, they also offer flexibility when used with imagination. So as a graphic designer, um, I uh, learned to really organize information um, with using grids. Um, and, uh, and I still, even though I don't draw a grid <coughs> at this point, um, the, I, I'm more of, it's more of an intuitive thing, but as I was going through my journal pages and um, you know, trying to figure out what my grid, what my system really was, I saw how most of them do fit into a pattern. You'll be learning a little later how to do this from in a reverse order. So you will have a grid, and then you can place elements in the grid yourself. Um, this is a um, three by t by three, so three um, vertical, two ver three vertical areas and three <coughs> horizontal areas. Um, and you don't need to confine them necessarily to uh, one air, one thing per um, per cell. You can um, you know add a couple of little little tiny. These are very tiny little um, landscapes or seascapes. So this is the white waves around a rock here and around these rocks. So it just gives an, it's another way, even a tiny little gesture like that can really add to your page and your, your story. Um, this is the larger location, which is in Drake's Bay. Um, this is Chimney Rock again. And then these are some of the wildflowers that were up there 
on chimney rock, as well as some swallow. Um, this is a, a study of six flowers. Um, so it is um, two wide, there are two deep by three wide. Um, and I asked my students to, uh, to first write about the flower they had chosen and then do a quick sketch and then color match. And, um, you know, it's always, it's always nice to, um, you know, add a few words of, or, and some fun to your page too. It's like the bees love it, so it's just like a little bee trail. Um, and I like also to put these little photo corners in. It sort of lightens the message, it's not so serious. <coughs> so it's nice to put a few kind of light, just light touches, I think. Um, now, and then I've asked myself, would, the, would this page have benefited by a location, a landscape, and it could have. Um, so it's just something to think about. Um, so in this situation, there were, there's a, a very tall um, waterfall, so I put that to the height of the, um, uh, of the page, and then there were some smaller, more squarish um, close-ups of water. Um, and here we have a, a rather uh, wide landscape, so I took up two of the cells, leaving an area for writing, and then color matching, and um, different little close-ups of bugs and butterflies. Also the title, Point Reyes Red Barn, sunny, 3.45 p.m., November 14th, 2015. Um, so you can bend the rules once you're comfortable with a grid. You can write, you can make a grid and then start filling it in, but also you can start, you can let it kind of flow. You can dance with it. Um, what I end up doing often is I've got, you know, images that I started with. So I started with actually what I was seeing. So, so the Red Rock, in Red Rock, the Joshua trees were on steroids this year. There was so much rain in, in Las Vegas area. And um, so they were all in bloom and they were like candelabras. They, you know, it was just amazing. These, these arms with these beautiful, huge blossoms like this big. And, um, so, it, so don't be afraid to overlap. So this is a, one of the arms of a Joshua tree. And then this is red rock in the background. So the mountains there, um, they have very uh, wonderful, pat, they're paddle, when they're budding, they have these wonderful little paddles which you can eat. And they have just like a, a mild vegetable kind of flavor. Um, and then they turn into these amazing big pods, and then they drop some seeds. Um, Joshua trees are having a big struggle right now in uh, in uh, Red Rock. They're, the heat, the changing uh, climate is uh, is hard on them, so they're very precious. Um, and the, so then I also like to use. So I've got my color matching dots here. I've got these here, which are related to this. Um, you might notice I've also just kind of done a vignette. So I have a, uh, I've let the, the color just kind of surround it in the image into a shape. Uh, and then these guys are just pencil, and, I'll pr and I decided to leave them that way. I just like the juxtaposition of pencil work and, and uh, painting. So I have um, something for you to explore. Um, are there any questions before I start? Okay, I'll go get these. Um, would someone help me pass out some? So this is uh, one for each person. And then I will bring you the handout. Do you 
want to do you want to show what you did afterwards, or we can do it again? Mm -hmm. okay. So, so the idea with this is you've been given a a um, a piece of vellum and a, a handout with grids on it. And on the back side, you have sketches, just outlines of, of different nature objects. And so what I'd like you to do is take your vellum and trace over a whole page of these grids. So if you, I have some extra um, pencils, if you don't have one, um, graphite, and also blue pencils if you'd like to experiment with that. So the idea would be to use, um, you do, you outline the, each of the, the pages basically with your graphite pencil and then go in with your blue pencil to make the grid lines. The reason is those will, event, once you start adding um, elements to your page, it'll, they'll pretty much disappear. But when you actually are doing a, a, a page, you could go ahead and, uh, in your journal, use your blue pencil and your, your graphite. So once you've done that, then, well, you notice on the other side you have a bunch of different elements. You can turn them sideways, you can uh, enlarge them. If you, these are just ideas and they're flexible, but they do have, for instance, this is um, that's to indicate writing, some birds, some, a small square landscape. Uh, this is a, actually an ocean landscape. Uh, trees, rocks, uh, columbine flower, uh, sunflower, um, Indian paintbrush, tree, bird, um, waterfall. So there's a bunch of different elements, bugs. Um, so, and then what you, that what I'd like you to do is start placing them in your grids. So, um, you can, you've got your grids on the vellum here, and then just start moving things around so that you can place elements in your grid. And in this one I actually forgot to put in the writing, but don't, I would like it if you didn't forget. Um, and so I have a title here, I have a flower, I have some rocks. I have some bugs, I have a landscape, and I have a tree, and my color matching dots. So the idea would be to make us, you know, fill the page with as many different ideas as possible, and don't be afraid to have them overlap, or overlapping can be just really wonderful. Um, but, uh, you know, turn them, enlarge them. Does anyone have any questions? It's like a puzzle, you know, putting the pieces mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. It so. seems like it parallels a lot of things in photography because a lot of people use the grid on their camera. That's and true. Them up, up there. Oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the, um, you know, oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fun, fun way to deal with those that uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. So fun is this. I'm seeing so a, a, a whole lot of experimentation. That's really fun. I think a lot of us kind of started playing with putting the landscape pito in the literally in the background of the object. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you think about that and you leave a little place open, who knows what you might fill it with? <laughs> but you can leave like little corners and then test it on the page in one just one little dot, and then I paint. So I'm not developing a whole uh, bunch of different colors first. I'm oh. mixing them as I go and then using them. And uh, you may have noticed that my palette is, it has a lot of colors on it already. It's not because I uh, am messy. I am a little messy. But uh, those colors can be used. Those are already pre-mixed colors yeah. that you've used. And so um, you can just dip right into them. Yeah. Did you try it? Um, you know, you what know I do, now. like I, on the color map, the dots I showed you on the page, um, you can, you, if you do, uh, you know, do uh, test swatches like that, 
Um, what those are is like, for instance, the violet. I put a little swatch of a little uh, mark of magenta and a little mark of the cyan. And then I try, I put two little um, circles of paint of each color and then I just kind of dip into them and I try and get as many colors as I possibly can using just those two, light and dark. Mm -hmm. So going to pastels as well. And the way you go about the pastels, everyone, uh, is to take off pigment. It's not to add water to your palette. You want to keep your palette dry as possible so that you can get the intense colors. It's once you have pools of water on your palette, it's going to be really hard to get the really strong colors again. Can you put the white gel tone <coughs> over a color? You can, but keep your, yeah. Right and make a pastel? It, uh, it's easier just to wick off, I think, pigment. The gel pen, you kind of don't want to get that mix, mixed up with your palette much because it's very opaque. And, and if you've got it on your brush and you just start going into different colors, it can start making everything look chalky. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, pastels is, I always like to say, you don't add water to make a pastel, you're going to need pigment. That's one of Jack's um, advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.